we begin uh, today's lecture by uh, starting to look at um, a detailed uh, view of each one of the component of a, of a gas turbine engine. So, we looked at the need for a gas turbine engine in the previous class. So, now we will start a, a detailed look at each one of the components of a turbojet engine. As you can see the major components are uh, an intake, a compressor, a combustor which is also uh, called the burner, a turbine and a nozzle. The nozzle itself uh, can have variations for example, a uh, nozzle of a simple turbojet engine or an after burning turbojet engine which uh, happens to be slightly more complicated. So, we will start our uh, discussion with a look at uh, intake which is actually not very crucial for uh, subsonic flights, but for supersonic flights it is very important. So, uh, subsonic flights it is not very crucial, but it is always present. So, we will start our discussion with that. The uh, basic objective of, uh, of an intake is to uh, provide the air at, uh, at the entry to the compressor with the highest possible total pressure that is the function. Now, in the case of uh, supersonic aircraft or aircraft which fly at supersonic speeds as we discussed earlier, uh, a considerable portion of the cycle pressure ratio can be achieved in the intake itself if we decelerate the flow properly the flow is decelerated properly, we can convert the momentum of the high speed air into a pressure rise. So, that means you know either the work done by the compressor is less or the compressor itself can be completely dispensed with if you are able to really go to high flight speeds. So, the idea is to convert the momentum of the uh, incoming air or free stream air to uh, pressure in the intake that is the primary uh, function of the intake. The other uh, important aspect is that the intake should be able to perform well. So, it must continue to deliver the required amount of mass flow rate to the engine at different angles of attack as well as yaw angles without disrupting the flow. So, irrespective of the angle of attack or the orientation of the intake with respect to the uh, flight direction, it must be able to give the required amount of air to the compressor. And that is very important otherwise if sufficient air is not given to the intake then it is going to stall or engine may even have a flame out which is then going to make things extremely difficult. So, the intake must continue to provide air to the engine at, odd ang at all angles of attack as well as yaw angles. Um, since we are talking about uh, decelerating the uh, air and converting the momentum to pressure, we are basically talking about a compression process. Okay. Now, intakes generally try to achieve compression in two modes. One is uh, through the so called internal compression. So, you can take for example, a subsonic flow and make it flow through a diverging passage. Automatically, the velocity decreases and the pressure increases, static pressure increases. So, that is internal compression. So, you basically allow the flow to go through a diverging passage and here we are talking about uh, subsonic uh, flight speeds. We are not talking about supersonic flight speeds. So, that is one part of it. The other part of it is to uh, shape the uh, diffuser duct itself in such a way that the uh, air stream approaches in a certain way. For example, if I uh, look at the uh, intakes here. So, these are typical intakes that are used in subsonic aircraft. So, you see the intake here and you can see the divergence of the passage from the uh, intake here to the uh, to the compressor inlet. So, there is a small divergence of the uh, duct that you can see here. You can see that here also. So, these are all uh, circular intakes. The intake in um, uh, in a Boeing 737. So, Boeing 737 has this type of an engine, a SNECMA engine and the intake here as you can see is not entirely circular. It is slightly flattened on the, on the bottom and that is because of the wing height from the uh, ground. If you use a completely circular intake on this uh, aircraft configuration, uh, during take off or landing there is a possibility that it can uh, touch the ground surface which is why the intake is slightly squashed and not circular in this particular case, but generally intakes are circular for uh, for all these engines and uh, you can see the uh, the idea here is to do both internal and external compression. What did I mean by external compression that is shown here. So, under design operating condition you can see that this is the intake. So, you can see the diverging area inside. So, the flow is further decelerated in the diverging area as the flow goes like this, the area of cross section increases. So, the flow is further decelerated that is internal compression. But because of the way in which the, uh, the, uh, the passage is itself designed, the if you look at the stream tube, free st uh, stream tube that enters the 
intake, you can see that the area of cross section in the free stream is actually smaller than at the intake itself. Which means there is a diffusion of the flow as the flow comes from the free stream and enters the engine intake. So you try to design these passages in such a way that uh, that can happen. Okay. So there is a A0 is the capture area and you can see an increase in the capture area here. And this increase in the capture area is also going to cause deceleration of the free stream and compression. So that is why we say that there are two modes of compression, one is the internal compression, another one is the external compression. Now external compression as I have said here uh, is achieved by shaping the lips of the diffuser duct. So you basically adjust the lips of the diffuser duct so that the free stream tube is in a certain way and there is compression in the free stream also that is one aspect. The other aspect is external compression is highly desirable because it is very close to being isentropic. There are no surfaces, right? there is no loss due to friction, there are no irreversibilities. So external compression is almost isentropic compression so it is very highly desirable. But we cannot do too much of it because if you try to do too much of it, then you run into certain problems. Okay? So you can see that the lips of the diffuser uh, duct are shaped in such a way as it comes here. It has a thick rounded lip which is almost like an inverted airfoil. So this causes the flow to approach with a smaller uh, free stream capture area compared to the intake entry area. And you can do a little bit of this because if you try to do too much uh, of external compression, what happens is you know as the flow goes around at higher subsonic speeds, as the flow goes around the lip of the intake, it can actually accelerate to supersonic speeds. And if you if it is not designed to handle supersonic speeds, then there can be a you know loss of stagnation pressure due to shocks and other things. If the equipment is designed to handle supersonic flow, then it will handle it properly. But for an equipment which is designed to handle only subsonic flow, local supersonic flow can cause problem. So you should not try to do too much of external compression, try to minimize it, minimize the loss of stagnation pressure so that at all flight speeds you have good, reasonably good efficiency. Right? So that is something that we must uh, avoid and again the flow velocities are very high. At large angles of attack you may have flow separation as the flow goes around the lips. If the angle of attack is very high then you can have flow separation. So these are some undesirable aspects so the lips have to be designed properly because we are saying that the lip is very thick. At higher angles of attack you can have separation. If it is a sharp lip then the possibility of separation is minimized and if it is a very thick uh, lip then possibility of separation is much more. Even in a sharp lip we can have separation but only under extreme angles of attack. For a reasonable range of the angles of attack, you can still have attached flow. But if the lip is thick, then you will have separation even for probably slight departures from optimal angles of attack. Okay? So that is why those are some of the drawbacks with the uh, with subsonic intakes. But the uh, compression that you are going to get is not very large. So basically, the intake provides uh, distortion-free flow into the fan at a reasonably uh, high uh, stagnation pressure. That is the general uh, idea in uh, in an intake in a subsonic aircraft. We will look at intakes for supersonic aircraft later on when we go to ramjets and so on. And there the intakes have to be designed very carefully. We have already done examples and we have also seen the theory behind supersonic diffusers. You know that you know there are lots of problems associated with them. So we will take a closer look. So what we uh, said in the, uh, in the uh, beginning of the propulsion lecture that there were two thermodynamic processes that we wanted to do. One was to increase the pressure, we said we wanted to increase the specific enthalpy and you do that by increasing the pressure and by increasing the temperature. So the first thing that we are going to look at is increasing the pressure because if you try to do it the other way around, right, let us say you increase the temperature first and then increase the pressure. Is there any downside to that or is it okay? The specific enthalpy increases when you increase these two terms. Does it matter, does the order matter, the order in which we do this? Is it important? Yes, sir. Why is that? Both, both uh, required to compress the particular pressure ratio is more at higher temperature. Yes, basically the simple thing is it requires more effort to compress hot air than cold air which means that you must compress first before adding heat. If you heat the air too much then it is going to take a lot of work to increase its pressure much more than what the turbine can possibly provide which is why you compress first and then add heat. So which is why after the intake we have the compressor. 
Right? Now, the compressor itself can be of different kinds. And remember, we are talking about what kind of pressure ratios are we talking about for a typical aircraft engine. As we said earlier, we are talking about pressure ratios around 40. Right? So, that is the kind of pressures that we want to reach. So, the compression itself can be accomplished for example, using reciprocating compressors. So, these are something like you know internal combustion engines where you have a reciprocating piston, air is drawn in like, uh, like I have shown here, the air is drawn into the cylinder uh, through the valve, the valve is then closed, the air is then compressed and once the pressure reaches a certain value, the outlet valve opens and the high pressure air leaves. This is how a reciprocating compressor operates. Now, there are certain problems with this reciprocating compressors for aviation application. One of the most important problem with this is that the pressure fluctuates, right? As again, as we said earlier, when we compared a jet engine with an IC engine, the operation is not continuous here. The, during the intake stroke, you do not have high pressure air being delivered, right? And high pressure air is delivered only during the uh, exhaust, exhaust stroke, for instance. Of course, we can avoid this problem by adding more cylinders, we can add more cylinders to this, but that is going to add to the weight and as we said, weight is a critical issue here, number one. Number two, the flow rates also tend to fluctuate, even if you add more cylinders, the fluctuations may go down, but they will not vanish, the pressure is going to still fluctuate and that is not really good for aviation application, it is not very desirable. The weight is the most important thing, the weight increases for a pressure ratio of 40, the pressure ratio is 2 or 3 then reciprocating compressor may be a, a suitable candidate, but for a pressure ratio of 40, reciprocating compressor is not going to be a suitable candidate, which is why we never use reciprocating compressors for aviation application. We always use rotary compressors. Rotary compressor itself, there are two kinds. One is, as you can see, uh, the radial or the centrifugal compressor. The other one is the axial compressor. The uh, terminology itself uh, is based on the fluid mechanics of the device. This compressor is called axial because the shaft is like this and the air flows along the axis of the shaft. Okay, so, the rotor rotates like this and the air flows along the axis of the shaft. That is why it is called an axial compressor. So, the blades are all mounted on a drum as you can see from here. The blades are mounted on a drum. And here I have shown only the, the rotors, meaning the blades that rotate with the drum. There are also stator blades in between each one of these rotor blades uh, that we will see uh, next. Okay? So, the blades are mounted and the blades rotate like this and the air itself flows from inlet to outlet along the axis of the shaft, which is why these compressors are called axial compressors. Now, in the case of a radial compressor, if you orient the shaft the same way, let us say the shaft is still like this. So, the shaft rotates like this, the air will enter along the axis and then flow out radially. That is why it is called a radial compressor. Now, the question is why must it enter axially and flow out radially? Why can't it enter radially and flow towards the axis? Centrifugal force can be used to compress the if it is flowing radially outward. But uh, what is, uh, is there any mathematical relationship or anything that states that it should always be that way, right? That is something that we must ask. Intuitively, it seems that that is correct, but we must also be able to back it up with, you know, ideas from fluid mechanics, which is something that we will do. So, the air enters axially, shaft rotates like this, air enters axially and then leaves radially, okay? That will actually uh, be an issue when we later on look at application into something like an aircraft engine, okay? So, keep this in mind, we will come back to this point. Now, how does a compression, pro what we are going to do next is the following, how does compression process uh, or how is compression achieved in these compressors? So, we start from the inlet for example here and then we, we proceed to the outlet or we start from the inlet here and then we proceed to the outlet, okay? So, we want to take a closer look at the nature of the compression process in these two devices. Okay? So, we start by doing the following. We start with the uh, steady flow energy equation, assuming that the compressors are operating at steady flow. This is the steady flow energy equation, which all of you are familiar with from your first level course in thermodynamics, right? We have assumed no heat loss, right? Steady flow operation. So, you can see that there is external work being input into the compressor and this is the change in enthalpy and kinetic energy. These are the absolute velocities as the flow goes through. So, W dot is M dot times this, 
from the steady flow energy equation. So, the work that we are putting in is causing change in velocity and a change in the enthalpy. And if it is being compressed, then the outlet enthalpy is going to be higher than the outlet enthalpy which is H2 is going to be higher than the inlet enthalpy. And remember work is being put into this device. So, that means in the thermodynamic perspective W for this is negative. Okay. So, that is something we will keep in mind. Now, remember these are rotary machines. So, I can also use another very famous equation from uh, turbo machinery which is the Euler's turbo machinery equation. What this states is across a rotor taking 1 to be the rotor inlet and 2 to be the rotor outlet across a rotor the work that we are putting in can be related to the change in kinetic energy. This is based entirely on fluid mechanics. This is based on thermodynamics. Right? This equation is thermodynamics, this equation is thermodynamics. What connects these two equations? W dot. Right? W dot is the term that connects these two equations. Right? They, these two must be the same. Correct? The W dot from here and the W dot from here must be the same. Notice that here we are using the following notation. V refers to the absolute velocity. U is the blade speed. Okay, and c is the relative velocity. Now, this relative velocity is the velocity that an observer will see if the observer is attached to the rotating blade itself. Okay, so, that is relative to the blade or in a frame of reference where the blade appears to be stationary. Okay. So, if I equate these two terms, what do I get? I can I get the following, I get this that the change in enthalpy, the change in enthalpy between inlet and outlet, one is the inlet, two is the outlet. So, this is a change in a thermodynamic property is related to the change in the velocity, fluid dynamic properties in this fashion. <coughs> so, now we are able to relate uh, changes in fluid dynamic quantities to changes in thermodynamic quantities. Okay. So, this is between inlet and outlet of a compressor of an entire compressor inlet and outlet of an entire compressor. Now, if I take a streamline, if I take a streamline from the inlet to the outlet and follow the streamline all the way from inlet to outlet, I can also write this as a differential in a differential form where the differential form tells me the pressure rise in the streamline as I go through the turbo machine. That is what I have done here to the right. I have written this in differential form as dh equal to this. So, if I take an inter incremental part of a streamline the change in enthalpy here is related to the change in velocity and the change in this blade speed and change in uh, relative velocity. So, in this case u is the blade speed, but you can also think of u as the component in the theta direction, direction of rotation of the fluid. So, the fluid has velocity in all these directions, right? that is what this is. So, change in enthalpy is related to these two quantities. But I also know how to relate dh to other thermodynamic properties because I know my TDS relationships. Right? TDS relationship tells me how to connect dh with other thermodynamic properties. So, if I do that, I get dh is equal to TDS plus Vdp which is a well known relation. If you assume, we have already assumed that in this when we wrote this equation, we already assumed that there is no heat interaction. So, we said q dot equal to 0. If I further assume that the compression process is isentropic, I can set this ds term to 0. So, I write the ds term to 0 and use the fact that the specific volume here is the reciprocal of the density, this dh becomes equal to dp over rho. So, now I finally have what I was looking for. How does the pressure rise take place as the fluid flows through the turbo machine? Right? Now, I have an equation which connects dp which is the pressure rise to the flow in the turbo machine. Okay? So, let us combine these two and finally write this equation like this. So, you have dp equal to d of u square over 2 where u itself is the blade speed which is equal to r omega at any point in the blade. At the root of the blade r will be equal to the radius of the root the tip it will be equal to tip radius in between it will have some other value. So, I have replaced u with r omega. So, you can see the dp over rho is equal is given by this expression. So, what this tells me is that any change in pressure happens due to two effects. First one is obviously the centrifugal effect. Second one is obviously the change in relative velocity. So, this is equivalent to 
what we saw earlier. Okay, let us look at this term by term. Now, let us assume that in a centrifugal, for example, in a centrifugal compressor, DC is usually 0. Remember, DC is the change in the relative velocity. That means, in a frame of reference where the blade appears to be stationary. So, what I have shown here is a centrifugal, this is the rotor of the centrifugal compressor and this is the stator. So, that does not rotate. So, if I focus my attention on the rotating blades, then in a frame of reference where the blade is stationary, the fluid enters this passage with a certain velocity and then you can see that there is a very small increase in the area of the passage. Right? So, from your quasi one dimensional flow, you know that since the flow area is changing only by little, the change in relative velocity is going to be very small because the passage area itself in, is increases only by a small amount. Remember, since we are looking at the rotor in a frame of reference where it is stationary, I should look only at the relative velocity. So, the when the rotor is frozen, the relative velocity, the flow enters with a certain relative velocity and if the passage area increases, then the relative velocity will decrease. Correct? So, you can see that here the, the increase in area is very small, which means DC change in relative velocity for a centrifugal compressor is going to be relatively small. The absolute velocity may be large, but what we are saying is change in relative velocity is small. Notice that the stator, you can see there is a there is a substantial increase in the cross sectional area for the stator because the absolute velocity of the fluid when it comes out of the rotor is very high. So, we increase the area so that the absolute velocity decreases and it is converted to static pressure. Whereas, in the rotor, in a, so when we look at the stator, we look at what happens to the absolute velocity because it is stationary and in the rotor because it is rotating, we look at relative velocity to make it stationary. So, DC is 0 in the centrifugal compressor. So, if DC is 0 in this equation, that means you only have this term and this is the pressure change in a streamline going from inlet to outlet. So, if I want a compressor, I want what do I want dp to be, the sign of dp to be? dp should be positive. So, if this term is absent, I have only this term, omega is constant, this is going to be positive if and only if dr is positive. dr is positive, what does that tell you? So, I have a streamline or a portion of a streamline, the pressure is increasing, for the pressure to increase dr is positive, that means it must flow radially outwards. Okay? So, what your intuition said is correct. The, uh, the fluid mechanics and the thermodynamic aspects of this backs up what, uh, what we thought earlier. So, any uh, radial flow turbine, the flow always flow, flows from higher radius towards the center. So, any centrifugal compressor, the flow is always from lower radius or the center outwards. That is what this equation tells you. So, you can have compression only when dr is positive. If you are extracting work, then dr will be negative. So, there is a reduction in pressure along the streamline. Okay? Now, if you look at an axial compressor and if you remember earlier, we saw the axial compressor and the flow direction we said was predominantly axial. In fact, the streamlines also will more or less be moving at the same radius. So, in other words, it is not like a centrifugal machine where you start at a lower radius and then you start moving to a higher radius. If you look at the streamlines, they are more or less at the same radius. They may be at different radii, but there is no change, significant change in the radial location of a streamline as it flows through the compressor, which means that dr is very small in an axial compressor. That means compression in an axial compressor is achieved predominantly through this term. Notice that for compression to be realized on a streamline, DC has to be negative. negative. So, that means the absolute the relative velocity must decrease. So, if you look at the rotor of an axial flow machine, this is a single rotor of an axial flow machine. And if I look at the cross sectional area of the blade passage, this is what the blade passage looks like. So, in a frame of, so what I have done here is, I have, so I have a rotor which rotates. So, I peel the outer surface and if I peel the outer surface along with the blades and then I arrange them out like this horizontally, this is what I will see. So, this is a developed view of the rotor. So, the rotor has blades all around, I cut it like this and then I peel it open like this and I lay it down, this is what it will look like. Right? So, for relative velocity you can see that the passage area increases 
which means the relative velocity will decrease from inlet to outlet. And that is how this compression is achieved. Now, the problem is this is a very, very poor way of achieving compression. Because as you decelerate the flow, as you know from your undergraduate fluid mechanics, the boundary layers near the wall will have a tendency to separate because the pressure is increasing in the direction of the flow. The, the free stream uh, diesel rates and the pressure increases in the direction of flow. So, the boundary layer will have a tendency to separate. Which means that if I have a rotor like this, the amount of pressure rise that I can realize here is going to be very small. Probably only may not be the pressure ratio may not be much higher than 1. Okay. In reality, the pressure ratios are actually only about 1.15 or so, no more than that. That is pressure at the outlet, static pressure at the outlet divided by static pressure at the inlet is not much more than 1.15 in this kind of compression process. Centrifugal compressor can be more. Okay. So, this brings out the essential fluid mechanic aspects of this compression. This will also, this has important bearing on any decisions that we make down the line in an actual application. So, judging by this discussion, what would be the logical choice for an aviation application? Do we compress? We have already decided that axial, the reciprocating compressor is not suitable. So, we are looking at rotary compressor, we have two choices. We have looked at the pros and cons. So, what do we decide now? Which is better? Centrifugal, centrifugal compressor, right? Good. So, let us look at other things about centrifugal compressors. Because the flow is radially outward in a centrifugal compressor, the cross-sectional area will have to be very large. Okay? It has to be quite large. Per unit mass flow rate, the cross-sectional area has to be large. Remember, we are taking air in at the center here through a smaller area and then the air flows out. So, for a given mass flow rate uh, and a pressure rise, the cross-sectional area will be very large. And if the cross-sectional area is large, then you know that there is going to be an increase in the drag the nasal will have to be large. So, there is going to be large frontal drag that is one downside. And what is the pressure ratio that we wanted across this uh, compressor? About 40, which means that we cannot do that with a single centrifugal compressor. It will simply be too huge to carry on an aircraft, which means what do I do? That means I have to do multi-stage compression. So, maybe I will achieve a pressure ratio of 4 in one compressor and then stack up 3 or 4 of those in, in tandem so that I achieve uh, the overall pressure ratio of 40 that I am looking for. If it is only 4, pressure ratio 4, then I can do with one machine. But if it is going to be more than that, then I will need to stack up the machines in tandem. Now, if you actually imagine doing this, so you have the first centrifugal compressor here. So, the flow enters axially, it comes out radially. So, I collect all the air. And now, I have another centrifugal compressor here. How do I feed this centrifugal compressor? I can't feed it radially. The air, the air for a compressor. Remember, our my equation tells me that dr has to be positive for compression to take place. That means I take the air from all the way around here, put it in a duct, bend the duct, bring it down like this, and then take it to the inlet of the next compressor. So that means I have to have very complex ducting from one to the other to take it all the way like this. It has to enter only near the axis and then flow radially outwards. So the ducting is also very complicated, and there can be tremendous losses of pressure, stagnation pressure in the ducting in between. Okay? So, they become very bulky. Although each stage can do a lot, multi-stage centrifugal compressors can be quite bulky because of all this additional consideration. Now, compression efficiency of a centrifugal machine is also generally lower than an axial machine. Axial machines have very steep uh, efficiency curves. So, the maximum point is high, but any departure from off design operation will lead to large changes, lot reduction in efficiency. Centrifugal compressors tend to have a flat operational curve. The maximum value is lesser, but they are more stable for departure from design operating condition. Whereas, centrifugal uh, axial compressors will operate very well at the design point, but operate very poorly in off design condition. So, the efficiency of a centrifugal machine is also less than that of a comparable axial machine. These are some of the disadvantages of the centrifugal machine. So, for this reason, 
Remember, just about a few minutes back you said that from a fluid mechanics and a thermodynamics perspective, the logical choice was a centrifugal machine. But when it actually comes down to the, uh, the uh, application, what choice do we make? We make the exact opposite choice, right? That is the reason why we must learn the theory and understand the implications, but in an actual application, there are other considerations, okay? So, an actual, in an actual application aircraft engine, the axial compressor is used. The downside is that as I said, the pressure ratio across each stage is going to be only around 1.15 or so, no more than that because if you try to do more than this, the flow will separate. Because you are diffusing the flow in the passage or you are decelerating the flow in the passage, it is always bound to flow separation. So, you cannot diffuse too much, which means I am going to need a lot of stages to accomplish a pressure ratio of 40. But fortunately for me, this kind of compression is actually a geometric progression, not a arithmetic progression. In other words, the number of stages required is not 40 divided by 1.15, but 1.15 raised to the power something equal to 40, right? At each stage, the pressure ratio is a certain value. So, the, so the, the pressure rise actually goes in a geometric progression, not in a linear fashion. Right? So, it goes in a geometric progression, which means that I need only 27 stages to accomplish a pressure ratio of 40. A linear progression would have said something around 35 or so. You may wonder, is the, does the addition of 8 more stages, does it make so much difference? Right? So even what if it is linear? It is only 8 more stages, right? The implications are tremendous because each one of these stage will have about 100 rotor blades and 100 stator blades, that is 200 blades per stage. So, 8 stages means how many blades? 1600 blades with the commensurate number of blades on the turbine side. If you are going to have 8 more stages in the compressor, that means you need to have, need to have more stages there. Perhaps not 8 more stages in the, in the turbine, maybe half as much. So, 1600 plus maybe another 500 to 600, that is about 2000 blades. 2000 blades means uh, they can add up to a lot of weight, right? And remember, the most important metric for the aircraft engine is power produced per unit weight of the engine. So, if I am able to get rid of 2000 blades, that means I have done a lot to even to begin with, okay? So, 8 stages may not when if you just look at it as 8 stages, it may not mean much, but if you look at the other implications, it means a lot. Okay? So, uh, that is one reason why the uh, axial compressor uh, has almost replaced centrifugal compressors in all aviation applications. There are still some small engines which use centrifugal compressors, but by and large most uh, aviation applications today uses only axial flow compressors. The advantage, the other advantage is they are very, very compact the flow is axial throughout. So, there is no entering axially and going out radially and then coming back axially and so on. Flow is axial throughout. So, that means I can design it much better. So, the compressor also tends to be compact. There are other advantages. The same design can be used for many different engine ratings. So, if I have, if I require a pressure ratio of 40, I use 27 stages. If it is a smaller engine which requires only a pressure ratio of 30, I can simply remove a few more stages the engine becomes shorter and I can get different pressure ratios. I need not start from scratch. So, it is very effective that way. Addition or removal of stages can actually allow me to use or produce engines for different ratings. So, that is the reason why axial compressors have largely replaced centrifugal compressors in aviation application, which is surprising from a fluid mechanics perspective because a single stage of a centrifugal compressor can achieve pressure ratios as much as, much as 4 or 5. But the real life design decisions are made not based purely on fluid mechanics or thermodynamics or gas dynamics, but also from other perspectives. And that is what you must understand as engineers. The concepts are very important. The concepts allow us to make 
very intelligent choices, but sometimes you also have to make choices which do not agree with the concepts that you are learning. That is all right. That is what makes real life interesting and life challenging for engineers. Okay? Let us take a closer look at uh, the operation of an axial compressor. So, here I have shown an axial compressor. The flow as you can see from here, the x coordinate runs from right to left. So, the flow enters from the right and then moves to the left in this way. And you see a multi-stage compressor here. There is a stator, there is a rotor. What is the uh, need for a stator? Let us just uh, quickly go to the previous one and see. So, you can see that when the, when the air flows through a rotor blade, which is rotating like this, the air comes out with a velocity vector, it enters this way, but it comes out with a velocity vector which is like this. So, before I can feed it to the next stage, I need to straighten it out, turn it back so that it can be fed into the next stage properly. As you can see from here, it needs to be turned back and the turning back is done by the stator blades, which is why we need stator blades. Otherwise, if I try to feed this directly to the next rotor, the rotor design for this will have to be different from the rotor design for this and so on. It keeps going like that. So, across 27 stages, I cannot have 27 different rotor designs. This way, I have only one rotor design. Each one produces 1.15 pressure rise. I know exactly what is happening in each stage. I do not have to worry about whether it is the first stage or the second stage, which is why we actually turn it around. But there is also a downside to this. And the downside is, what are these uh, stator blades doing for me? besides turning the flow, nothing, right. So, it is adding to the weight and it is not doing anything useful for me, it is only turning the flow, right. So, these are when I, when I start, when I want to reduce weight, these are things that we must look at and see whether we can do something that is better. And we will see this when we look at the new frontiers and what kind of things engine companies are doing, engine manufacturers are doing, okay. So, these are the questions that you must ask. So, if you look at the axial compressor, you can see the stator. The purpose of the stator, as I said, is to make sure that the flow is directed properly onto the rotor blades. So, in a frame of reference where the rotor is stationary, the relative velocity vector must be tangential to the blade surface at entry and tangential to the blade surface at exit. This is the relative velocity vector, not the absolute velocity vector. Okay, so, in a frame of reference where the blade is stationary, this is what the relative velocity vector should look like. Okay, so, each one takes the velocity vector, absolute, the stator takes the absolute velocity vector, turns it back so that it approaches this in, a, in the correct design angle. Okay. You can also see, for example, the, this is the aerofoil shape of the blade cross section and you can see that the cross sectional area increases as we go from inlet to outlet not by much because the pressure ratio is only 1.15. So, we cannot have large increases of cross sectional area in the case of a compressor. And that is also the reason why the blades are very slender. If given the blade, if given a blade, how do you tell it is a compressor blade or a turbine blade? If it is very slender, it is going to be a compressor blade turbine blade will be much thicker and we will see that when we go to uh, discussion of turbines further down. So, these are very slender mainly because the compression that I am trying to achieve pressure ratio is only 1.15, no more than that. Okay? Other important aspects about the uh, fluid dynamic aspects about the blades. So, here we have the velocity triangle at the inlet to a rotor. So, you can see that the uh, blade speed vector is in this direction, the blades are rotating like this. right? We know that the relative velocity must be tangential to the blade surface. So, given a blade profile, I can draw this relative velocity vector. Okay? And you know that the relative velocity is nothing but the absolute velocity minus the blade speed. Absolute velocity minus the blade speed, which means that the absolute velocity is the relative velocity plus the the blade speed. So, you can see that in this vector addition, you can see relative velocity plus the blade velocity gives me the absolute velocity. Correct? Notice the direction, the change in the direction or orientation of the relative velocity vector and the absolute velocity vector. The relative velocity vector is actually like this, but the absolute velocity is like this. So, it has to be 
turned properly so that it will move, glide on to the surface of the rotor blade in this uh, thing. So, the stator blade accomplishes that. That is the inlet velocity triangle. Exit velocity triangle, remember this is an axial machine. So, blade speed remains the same right? and there is a reduction in the relative velocity. We said that the relative velocity must decrease from inlet to outlet because we are diffusing the flow by decelerating the flow. So, C2 is going to be less than C1. And because of this blade uh, profiles are, you can also see that C2, the angle is also different. But whenever we design an axial flow compressor, normally we will try to keep the axial velocity the same, which means that the axial direction is given here, x is along this. So, the axial component of the velocity is this, right. So, you can see that between inlet to outlet, we have tried to maintain the axial velocity the same, but C2 is less than C1 u is also the same between these two. So, the outlet velocity triangle then looks like this C2 plus u is equal to V2, right. So, we have had three things. One, blade speed remains the same between inlet and outlet that is this one. Axial velocity, axial component remains the same between inlet and outlet. So, that means this component is equal to this component and relative velocity at the outlet is less than the relative velocity at the inlet. That is what the, this triangle shows me. If I combine these two triangles, then I have this triangle. This is the combined triangle which is drawn on the basis that u is the same for both. So, I have taken this u to be the common base for both the triangles and then I have drawn the triangles and you can see that the reduction in relative velocity from here to here. But most importantly, you can also see the relative change in the vector, absolute vector between inlet and outlet. This combined velocity diagram is rich in information, okay. For example, what are the inferences given a velocity triangle like this? What are the inferences that I can draw from a velocity triangle? Number one, the blade speed is constant. This tells me that this is a velocity triangle for an axial machine, correct? Number two, the change in the velocity vector delta v is in the same direction as the blade speed, which tells me that, remember what does this tell me? This is the change in the absolute velocity of the fluid. If it is in the same direction as the blade speed, that means we are doing work to increase the velocity of the fluid in this direction. Right? So, blade speed and this are the same. So, that means work is done on the fluid to change its velocity in this direction. Since we are doing work to increase the velocity, what kind of a machine is it? It is a compressor. So, that tells me that it is a compressor. There is an next piece of information that we can infer from this. Judging by the relative velocity, C1 is not equal to C2. There is a change in the relative velocity between inlet and outlet. That tells me that this is a reaction machine and not an impulse machine, right. That means that there is a change in the relative velocity in the blade passage and due to the work transfer. So, it is a reaction machine and not an impulse machine. Those who have studied turbo machinery should be able to relate it to that. So, the magnitude of the, of the relative velocity has changed. If the magnitude of the relative velocity does not change, remember magnitude of the relative velocity does not change, then it is an impulse machine. If the magnitude of the relative velocity changes between inlet and outlet of the rotor, then it is a reaction machine. And the amount by which this changes is usually related to a quantity. What is that quantity? Degree of reaction. Degree of reaction. Okay. Remember, it is the change in magnitude that we are talking about, not the change in the direction, okay. Change in magnitude of relative velocity tells me that the in this case because the relative velocity has decreased, this tells me that it is actually being diffused in the blade passage and so it is a compressor. This also tells me that it is a compressor. I can also infer that this is a compressor by looking at the magnitude of the change in velocity. The magnitude of the change in velocity is not very large. Either this or this is not very large. So, this tells me that the flow turning inside the blade passage is very minimal, right. This is very small. So, that means the flow turning is also very small. 
the flow turning is small. That means that the flow turning is related to something called blade loading coefficient. The blade loading coefficient uh, refers to how much work is being transferred into the fluid. That is the blade loading coefficient. If the blade loading coefficient is very large, that means lot of work interaction is taking place. If it is small, then work interaction is small. The blade loading coefficient is directly related to the delta V, which is in the direction of this. The component delta V, which is parallel to U, is the work interaction that is taking place. If you have studied turbo machinery before, you would know that the work is related to a component called VW, the world velocity component. Remember, that is the component which is parallel to U. If delta V has a large component parallel to U, that means large amount of work is being put in. And if that happens, then the flow turning will also be very large. So here, as you can see from here, from here to here, you can see that the flow turning is not very large. That also tells me that it is a compressor blade. All this happens because we chose to use a diffusion process for compression. Because it is a diffusion process and prone to separation, I am restricted to 1.5. Because I am restricted to 1.5, I need to have 27 stages to accomplish a pressure ratio of 40. And the work transfer that I put in per stage is also limited because the pressure rise has to be limited which means that the blades have to be, the flow turning is not very large because my work interaction is not very large. The flow turning is also not very large, flow turning is very small, which means what does that say about, so, so far we have looked at a sequence of events based on a single decision that we made. We decided to use the second term in that equation that we derived, dp. So that meant that there is a problem with that process, so I will restrict it to 1.15. I restrict it to 1.15, 1, I have lot, large number of blades. Number 2, each blade, the work transfer is small, blade loading coefficient is small. That means flow turning is small. If flow turning is small, what does it say about the thickness of the blades? The blades have to be very slender, right? The blades have to be thin and very slender. If they are not thin and very slender, then there will be large changes in the blade passage area, right? The blades have to be thin and very slender. Now we have gone from a fluid mechanic, implications of that decision on the fluid mechanic aspects. Now we are moving on to structural aspects. So the blades are long and slender and thin. Then there are tremendous structural attributes. How do we make them stiff? So that is the material and structural design aspects. So the single decision that you take in the early part of the design cycle has tremendous implications down the line. Right? So that is the most important thing that you get from such a velocity diagram and the fluid mechanical aspects of these rotors. Okay, so we will uh, continue the discussion from the next class onwards. We will look at off-design operation of the compressors also, which is actually a major challenge in aviation application.